Welcome to class. My name is Sandra Batagas, and I'm here to take you through this course focusing on Windows Server 2012. Could be a familiar face. I spent a lot of time with Server 2012, as I have with 2008, 2008 R2, and moving on down the line. I've actually been working with the Microsoft Networking Technologies since we had LAN Manager, DOS 5.0, and Windows 3.1. So I've seen my share of Microsoft exams, my share of classroom time, but really in addition to this, we do go out and consult on a regular basis. So I tend to live quite a bit out in the trenches with the rest of you, setting up these networks and learning how to support them. So based on that, I hope you have a great course. I'm here to share what I know to help you prepare for your most recent test and also to get used to a brand new environment. In this module, we're going to learn all about installing and configuring servers. When we do our installations, this means before we run any version of setup or boot to an actual bootable media, we have to do a little bit of planning. We'll plan our server installation as well as the server roles that it's going to handle. If we're doing upgrades, what types of things we have to think about for upgrades. And of course, also learn a little bit about Server Core, which is a whole different way of looking at Windows Server Operating System. When we move through the configuration, we're going to learn not just how to configure servers, but we'll also spend some time with Server Core. We'll learn about how to delegate administration, add and remove features, deal with some images, some offline images, as well as deploy roles on remote servers that we don't happen to be sitting directly in front of. Last but not least, we will mention local storage. So we'll design our storage spaces so that we have the most efficient usage of any amount of space to store our data and our applications. This will go through basic and dynamic disks, as well as the difference between MBR and GPT disks, and of course, how to manage those volumes, how to create VHDs, and configure our storage pools as well. The first thing I would like to address is on-premise versus cloud. Now, we always have the technical documentation, and you see lots and lots about cloud computing. So everyone always asks me what we're going to do or why we would. Why don't we just put everything in a cloud? As a matter of fact, I had this conversation less than a week ago with a very good client of mine. They're a relatively small network. They have a couple of servers. Most of what they have is realistically in the, in the cloud in terms of all of the applications they use to track their customers, the customer's data, and everything that they do. Their email is also in the cloud. We also have SharePoint out in the cloud. So based on that, the conversation was really, why, why do I need to buy a new server? Why can't we just let this you know, run into the ground and continue? Well, the big issue here is really what type of services you want to give the actual computers. So before I go through the what the on-premise can do for you, let's talk a little bit about what the cloud is all about. Now, the cloud is becoming increasingly popular. I personally have a good portion of my customers out in the cloud. And really what happens is services like email or SharePoint sites, even data stores or data backups can all be taking place at the cloud. You can also host an actual server in the cloud, and there's a number of ways to do that, whether you're going through the Microsoft version of hosting full servers, or of course, you have someone in an actual data center space where you're sharing their space and you have your own server. The whole point of cloud computing is to make resources available to you regardless of where you are. We have a lot of users that are now working from home, from remote offices. We have workers everywhere. So by having something as central as the cloud works extremely well. Now, if we talk something as simple as storage and shared resources, I can say even for a lot of what I do. So as we teach these courses and I write my slides, I get to email them to editing, they get to email me back. And after about the fifth email, we can be very confused on what versions are happening. With something like a cloud or a SharePoint site, you can upload, keep version information, keep common information, and have everything in one site. As a matter of fact, I can edit right there from the cloud. So it doesn't matter if I'm in my home office, my business office, or at a customer site, I can access all that information and continue to work on it. So that really is the feature of the cloud. If you put your email in the cloud, it means if you lose your internet connection, it doesn't mean your emails are going to be bouncing and not coming in. They may be bouncing 
to your desktop, but they'll still come in your phones or be available via web access. So it's all about high availability regardless of where you're working. That's what the cloud is all about. So what we typically see is storage, email, and items like SQL Server up in the cloud so that we don't have to maintain them locally as well as redundant internet. Now, with the cloud, common cloud computing, again, it does depend on how you're going to do it. Now, you can lease the services from Microsoft. I have a lot of customers on 365. And here we do everything from Dynamics to Exchange Server, but you can also host your SQL Server and your Microsoft System Center. Some of the other things that can happen in the cloud is you have something called an infrastructure as service, otherwise known as IaaS, which means you have a full virtual machine, but it's being hosted in the cloud. As a matter of fact, I had mentioned a customer where everything's in the cloud, so do we actually need an, an on-site server? Really, everything being in the cloud, but they're using a remote desktop technology to go into a virtual machine, which happens to be a virtual server in Hyper-V. The advantage, of course, someone else gets to play with the hardware, not only manage it and back it up, make sure the redundancy is there, but we still have to maintain the desktop experience and the software in that server. Now, Microsoft does have Windows Azure, which is available for you to go ahead and put your infrastructure up there in the cloud. Now, we also have software service, which means they're going to host a particular application or infrastructure for a technical application. And we, of course, have Intune, which is all for PC maintenance, but the one that most people have heard of is Office 365, where you have full-blown Exchange server, you have full-blown SharePoint sites, and everything that you're doing is up in the cloud. A third version, or I guess we'll call it category of cloud computing, is something called Platform as Service, or PaaS, which means the hosting provider will provision the platform, and this platform is how we're going to host all of our database applications. Now, they'll provide the database, and then, of course, we get to manage it. So, realistically, unless you're getting into the background of MCSE and getting into the background of really planning this architecture, the acronyms of IAAS, SAAS, and PAAS really isn't more common speak, but really to show you that we have three distinct categories of how we're going to host information in the cloud. So the cloud is very handy for high availability and letting someone else take care of the hardware and the backups. So why is it that we need an actual local server? Why do we need an on-premise server? The biggest piece of why you want local resources provided to the clients on the on-premise side is for the network infrastructure itself, which means when you turn on a client computer, you need an IP address. It's got to have a default gateway. It's got to have accessibility to DNS, not only for internet name resolution, but internal name resolution. Um, all of our authentication through Active Directory, where the users are going to log on, and of course, application updates. So when I go into a server, I can go ahead and push out Windows updates through WSUS, but I can also install other third-party applications. So maybe they use Norton Antivirus. I put the management console on the server, I upgrade only the server, I push that out as well as virus updates um, or virus definition updates to all the client workstations. So all of this is handier than having, let's say, in a small network, 10 or 15 or even 500 in a larger network, clients with static IP addresses, static IP configurations, and then local user accounts. So when someone locks themselves out and no one knows the administrator password locally, at this point, they're no longer in trouble. So on the peer-to-peer -peer network, it is harder to manage but can be done with an on-premise server. We can provide that network infrastructure and not only make it easier to maintain and administrate, but also gives us an ability to unlock user accounts when they don't know their password. Because again, if no one knows a password to that local machine or it's been changed, we're really powerless without a domain admin. And again, any of the application updates, whether it happens to be for an antivirus program or whether it happens to be for Windows updates. Now, Server 2012 is promoted as cloud ready, but you still need those local resources. And a good example is I just put out an implementation where Active Directory synchronized with an enterprise Office 365, so we have a single sign-on, which provides my email access and my Windows access, 
and I'm really the same user even though Exchange is not necessarily on-premise. I'm going to go quickly go through a couple of slides with our Windows Server editions. You need to understand that it's not just Windows Server, but there are licensing issues and actually cost issues with each one of the editions, so you get to pick the one that closely maps to what you need. Standard edition is what I see the most of. You have everything you need, all roles, all features. They're all going to be available. Nowadays, we can go up to four terabytes of RAM, so you should be covered there. You have, I can have up to 64 sockets. And with standard edition, if you install the Hyper-V role, assuming your hardware is Hyper-V ready, and most new hardware is, you can use that same license that you installed the server with to create two more servers in the Hyper-V console as virtual machines. So essentially, you can buy one server and get three. Data center is really if you've got an enormous corporation, let's say Microsoft, where you have pods of servers everywhere, you need all the roles and all the features, but really what's going to happen with data center is you're also looking for unlimited virtual machine licenses. Now, I say this is what you would use if you're a large organization, but even a small, medium-sized organization, I have a local police department that's got about 350 users, but we need a lot of servers. We did virtualize everything, and then what we took a look at is how many servers we needed to add. It was cheaper to buy the data center license than it was to buy the standard edition license for everything that we needed. So now, no matter what we want to populate a virtual machine with, we've got an unlimited license to do it. So you'll see you've got up to 64 sockets, but you do have more processor cores to work with, and again, you're up to four terabytes of RAM that will pretty much cover you regardless. Foundation is really a pretty super basic server. Maybe you just need a file server. Now, the problem with foundation is it can't be joined to a domain, so I use the term file server very, very gently. I might use this for a web server, for a local storage server, but again, we really can't work through the domain membership here, so you're looking at, I guess I'll call it an expensive workstation. A couple other additions you might want to know about. We have the Essentials Edition. So for those of you who've heard about Small Business Server and you're still looking for it, this is going to be your replacement. Now, the intention of a Small Business Server is to provide an enormous network infrastructure to a smaller organization. So if I have a small organization, I might need email, I might need SQL Server, I need actual infrastructure. So all of this comes at a cost of a different license. So let's be super generic and say, you know, to buy Exchange and all the client access license, maybe I'm looking at 2K for a small company and maybe it's the same thing for SQL. And then this comes with the operating system. And there are actually other servers as well. So to have a small business server, it includes a minimal license of all of this so that they're not incurring all of these high costs for a small organization. Now, you're going to have Exchange Server, but you can't have it enterprise-wide. So you don't have necessarily the enterprise version. You have what we'd consider a small business server. Same thing for SQL. So it is a replacement of SBS. Uh, we don't have Hyper-V or clustering or core. It can't be an RDP server, so people can't be terminaling in with their own sessions. And here is where the power and the licensing makes a determination. You have a 25 user limit. You have a 50 device limit. You can only have two processor cores, and you're limited to 64 gigs of RAM, which again, for this type of edition, is more than enough. We have Hyper-V edition. Hyper-V means we have no user interface, we have no licensing fee for the operating system. We actually license the virtual machines individually. You have limited file services. Think of it as enough to actually host all your ISO files and what's needed for Hyper-V. Hyper-V can join a domain, and you've got 64 sockets and 4 terabytes of RAM. We have two storage editions. We have Workgroup Edition and Standard Edition. The big difference between the two 
is when you're looking at a work group edition, it does limit you in the amount of user connections. And of course, a work group means no Active Directory. And your standard edition allows you to support a domain membership. And you can license this for every two sockets. We also have multipoint, which means many users using the same host, but with separate input and output mouse, keyboard, and monitor. Um, we have socket, limited amount of RAM. We're looking at 12 session max, and not a lot of infrastructure roles or Active Directory support. And last but certainly not least, we have multipoint premium, which means, again, multiple users using the same host with input and output. Um, we really have an ability to put on more RAM, more sessions, and a little bit of the network infrastructure. Server 2012 has an awful lot of roles. In fact, I've got a couple pages of them. So the ability to do things is there. It's just finding out what you need to accomplish and what role matches. So in general, let's go through fairly quickly all of the different server roles so you have a general idea how the management and the role management is handled. Now, most people are used to thinking about Active Directory. Well, it's no longer as simple as Active Directory in a domain controller. You have Active Directory directory services for your users and your computer accounts, and this is really where your domains come from. But Active Directory also has certificate services, federation services, LDS, rights management. All of these together are part of Active Directory, but each one of them is compartmentalized into its own role. We also have a role called application server. So before you start hosting applications, um, maybe it's Exchange or maybe it's even something fairly small, you have to have the application server role on there. Now, this is really what provides some of the .NET framework and the .NET enterprise services that are needed by most of these applications. We have server roles for infrastructure. The separate infrastructure roles are DHCP and DNS. So we can give out IP address configuration and we can also do some name resolution. We have fax server if you want to send and receive shared faxes. We have file and storage services, which is how you're going to actually make data available to the clients, meaning file shares and documents. Hyper-V for your virtualized environment. We have a network policy server, so as clients are joining the network, whether locally or via an actual VPN, we can make sure that those clients are healthy before they have access to the resources. So that's a really good security layer. Print and document services, remote access services, remote desktop services. And then, of course, we can get down through licensing. If you're licensing in a large organization, you don't want to have a onesie, twosie from desk to desk, but to actually have volume activation services installed so you can manage all of those volume licenses. IIS, of course, is for our web server. We have Windows DS, which allows us to deploy the operating systems to clients throughout the network, also known as WDS. We've got a few acronyms as it's been growing up through the versions. And of course, we also have WSUS, where we can install a server role to gather all the updates for Windows and associated applications. As they come in, we can approve them, and then they automatically go out to the clients. This, of course, is better than every client updating individually. So there's a lot of different server roles, and each one of those have a unique perspective on what you want that server to do. I do like that it's compartmentalized, so for performance alone, you can make a plan on what a server is going to do and make sure it's fully configured for just that role. Roles, of course, can be shared, and they can also coexist on the same server. I can have one server with many roles. It really is up to the hardware in which services you're trying to host.